Um, today, it's a, it's a pleasure to have Eva Misselson here. He is a founder and channel partner at LDV Capital. Um, in other words, he runs the show. So he is basically LDV Capital and along with his other partners, of course. Um, so for those who don't know LDV, um, it's a VC fund and they are, they are specialized in investing into computer vision technology, of course, with a lot of um, focus on machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, across several areas, and um, you might have heard it in the news, there's um, a lot of recent success with, with many of the startups they invested recently. Um, they are growing the team, which speaks for the success of the, of the, of the capital um, they're investing. Um, in addition to the investments itself, um, actually, Evan is a, is a big driver in the community. Um, he created essentially a whole platform um, which features an annual LDB Vision Summit. Um, they have 3,000 experts, they have monthly community events, dinners, they have over 1,000 members. Um, and it's pretty fun because they're essentially connecting the cutting edge research in the academic community on one hand, and on the other hand, um, you know, founders and um, also venture capitalists. And I think this is really fantastic, especially that I think um, in, in difficult times, um, like the corona crisis right now, um, that we're making these connections and helping, um, you know, to, to, to create new businesses on this kind of all digital technology. Um, Evan himself has also built several businesses. He's, um, he knows the startup scene in and out. He has, um, um, has a lot of success with all of his mentors. Um, he's also a fan of um, pictures itself that probably explains um, why he is investing into um, all the commission technology. Um, the reason why I know him and be our own startup, um, Synthesia, it's a startup in London um, based on, on AI media. Um, his uh, venture capital uh, firm has also invested there. And I have to say, it's really a pleasure to work with him. It's really fantastic. Um, all the things that the academics typically don't know, he brings to the table. And it's really great that, that he's having a lot of patience with us and guiding us um, towards building a successful business. Um, and I can only um, recommend anyone who is interested in, in startups, um, reach out to him. He's, he's a fantastic uh, person to work with. He's very constructive, gives a lot of feedback and support, um, even though we are sometimes a little bit slow um, <laughs> on our end. And, and one of the reasons also why we have him here, we have, of course, a very active startup scene here in Munich as well. Um, he's, he's very engaged into, um, yeah, as a, as a US um, venture capital firm, they're very invested into investing in Europe. So I hope um, we can also have um, some connections being made here today afterwards, both on the academic level and as well as the business level. So um, yeah, Evan will talk about um, um, how to basically turn research into great companies. And I'm really excited to have him. And uh, yeah, you have basically, I think we roughly have an hour. So um, yeah, the stage is yours, Evan. Matthias, thank you very much. I'm honored, I'm honored to be here and, and uh, appreciate all the kind words. Uh, you know, it's all about people building businesses and people building um, uh, technology and hopefully uh, improving the world. Uh, I'm going to talk about a bunch of trends in visual technologies. And then towards the end, we'll talk about uh, some examples of companies we've invested in that are deep tech and monetizing and commercializing research. And then hopefully we can have a part of the session we'll be discussing, uh, answering any questions that you may have. So as Matthias mentioned, I'm Evan Nisselson. I'm the founder and general partner at LDV Capital. Um, I want everybody, I can't know if you're gonna do this, but let's just do a little exercise. Everybody close your eyes for two seconds. Now open them and what do you see? You see light. All light is visual data. The majority of the data that our brains analyze is visual. For example, you've got photos, you've got video, 360, thermal, LIDAR, radar, medical imaging, satellite imaging. Visual technologies, uh, we define it as any technology that captures, analyzes, filters, displays, distributes visual data. And as Matthias mentioned, it typically leverages computer vision, machine learning, and or artificial intelligence. We invest uh, horizontally across all sectors. So some people call us a thesis-driven generalist fund. Whether or not it's agriculture on the upper left, for that robot to pick up the tomatoes, it's gotta to have cameras and computer vision or medical imaging, or the third one, Synthetic Media, which is the company collaborating with, with Synthesia and Matthias, as he mentioned earlier. Logistics, manufacturing, autonomous vehicles could not drive unless 
visual data is captured from either LIDAR, radar, or commoditized cameras and analyzed via computer vision and machine learning. These are many different sectors of which we invest. As Matthias mentioned, uh, you know, we can't do this alone. We have a unique team. Uh, I did start the fund uh, in 2012 when everybody said it was cute niche in science fiction. I built four visual technology businesses over 18 years as an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, New York, and Europe. Abby helps out uh, is a core person on our team on operations. Uh, venture partner, Peter Stern, who has a, built a couple of companies, one he sold for 1.6 billion. Uh, Merrill's an associate, Kat is in marketing, and Merritt is a summer uh, associate. But we don't have all the answers. We have a lot of experts and many that are not even on this list that help us do due diligence, advise in companies um, and uh, help us collaborate. So from Surge, from Cornell Tech, we also, help, we also work with Matthias who's not on this list, but these are people that get involved, um, as I mentioned, because we don't have all the answers. It's a mixture of professors and serial entrepreneurs. Mike co-founded CTO of Instagram, Steve of YouTube, and Jan Eric who recently sold Mapillary to Facebook. Uh, it's a good example, Jan Eric. We invest. We were the first investor in, in 2014. Jan Eric sold his last company to Polar Rose, uh, Polar Rose to Apple, and prior to that, a uh, PhD in in imaging. And he's a perfect example. We invest very, very early, um, either at initial validations or even uh, if people that we've known for many years, even we've even given term sheets before a company is incorporated. So there's a lot of logos here, but as examples, the companies on the left, one of the most important things for us is we're not a large fund, but we get very involved and honored that 60% of our companies at least raise follow on from these major venture funds. And that's a key piece of the puzzle in growing a business. As Matthias mentioned, in addition to the unique thesis, we have a annual vision summit, a monthly dinner series, we actually also are developing our own software to be to scale, and we have our insights reports every summer. We also kicked off recently a, a video series with women leading visual tech, and Lourdes, another co-founder from Synthesia, we just published, I think, yesterday on our website. So let's get into the kind of meat of this session, and I'm going to rapid fire through many examples, and hopefully many of you are working in different sectors or have aspirations to monetize and commercialize your research. So let's talk about some trends. Obviously during this pandemic, it's really scary, but visual tech is really on that front line to flatten the curve from thermal detecting temperature in all across, you know, from back to work scenarios or at the airport. Obviously we couldn't be doing this session virtually, hopefully with hundreds of people listening and watching from all over the world. Obviously we miss the face-to-face -face interaction, but visual technologies, this is just the beginning. There are many companies that are gonna be taking the next level of video conferencing to enable hopefully more of a feeling of what it's like to be in person. I don't think it's ever gonna replace that interaction of in-person, but hopefully get us even closer and closer to virtually interacting. So here's another example you might not think about obviously, but using shortwave ultraviolet light to um, disinfect hospitals. And this is a robot moving around a hospital or the obvious thermal camera at the airports. This summer, we just did our in-depth research on uh, food and agriculture and how visual technologies are driving innovation. We had a virtual event uh, a week ago and we're gonna publish the report soon. But here are a couple of examples. Everything from farm to your fridge, there's gonna be visual technologies that will hopefully increase uh, productivity, decrease waste, uh, create new uh, types of food. And we're very excited about this sector from drones and satellites analyzing the agricultural crops to stationary cameras and I apologize for all the text here, but just giving you an example, you'll be able to download this for free um, as soon as we publish it. Another sector is very exciting, which molecular imaging is vital for cellular ag. So creating new types of proteins and new types of food 
is a big part of the future of the food and ag industry. And it could not be done without molecular imaging uh, finding these new opportunities. Another sector which we're really excited about and have made several investments and look to make more is the healthcare space. So sectors to watch, everything from diagnosis to continuing care and prevention. Hopefully visual technologies will help society and business be more proactive in helping us be healthy rather than the history of healthcare is reactive. You know, you go to the doctor um, and they say you have late stage cancer or something else. Why can't we be more proactive? One of the things will be image guided surgery will exponentially grow, such as this Da Vinci robotic surgery uh, uh, machine. But we also see this is a huge device. Devices are gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller, leveraging uh, uh, new perception sensors and new uh, algorithms that will hopefully analyze uh, our ailments. One uh, thing, that, so we did this report two years ago and we forecasted that virtual visits would surpass physical visits. And now during this pandemic, it's kind of obvious, but amazing that we sometimes uh, get it right in advance. And the goal is we don't have all the answers, but we want to be educated before all of you who are smarter than us in different sectors come up with new advancements of technology that hopefully will help virtual doctor visits become more efficient. Obviously, this is like a command central. And you can imagine all the visual data here from heart rates to maybe scanning virtually to communicating virtually could not be done without visual technologies. Monitoring patients is another great example of that. And one company uh, that's really exciting is Psyonic. Psyonic's basically building uh, wearable clothing that will, help, that will help disabled and senior citizens delay the need for crutches. So what if you could charge this once a day and it could adaptively learn how you walk with visual technology, with software and hardware that will basically be like Lycra and help disabled people uh, walk and act um, more normally. Another thing obviously is in the radiologist space, huge advancements here. But what's interesting is many companies are trying to replace radiologists. I don't think that's the holy grail. It is an opportunity to collaborate with them and enable them to see more patients more rapidly and be more accurate with many different imaging modalities. For example, Ezra is one of the companies we invested in, which is a full body MRI scan. They can analyze the prostate, for example, this 3D model of a prostate proactively. Why is it, like I mentioned earlier, that society has to have that unfortunate experience of waiting for the doctor to say, you have late stage cancer and you can't do anything about it. I would rather get a scan every year or every other year, many years in advance to say, hey, there's this potential spot in your heart or lungs or kidneys that, or pancreas or prostate where you might have cancer, but we can act on it now. And many doctors are saying Ezra found cancer before they could even detect it. Another report we did in, two, uh, in 2017, we estimated that there'll be 45 billion cameras in the world exponentially growing and you know historically we all think of cameras that, that we make pictures of friends for memories and to communicate but the growth of this visual data majority of this data will never be seen by humans it'll be computers to computers talking to each other and analyzing visual data we expect the growth not just to be in the handheld cameras which is basically your smartphone because there's two or three cameras on the front on the back and maybe two on the front Eventually, it's going to cover the whole phone. And, and this is another one of those things that people say I'm crazy, but it, it's happening. You can see the legacy cameras that are, are decreasing. 3D cameras are increasing. One of the sectors really excites us is nanophotonics. It's really pushing the envelope, uh, the, the, the envelope with computation and sensing. And for those of you that are not familiar, a quick definition, the study and behavior of light at the nano scale. So if you think of a sheet of paper, 
is about 100,000 nanometers thick. Obviously an example of the light spectrum across the ways that we all invest, this is an example of how we view the world. Refreshing from the beginning where you say, hey, majority of the data that our brains analyze is visual. AI will not succeed if it doesn't understand the analysis of visual data. This is me in a nanofab lab. So some of the benefits of investing and collaborating with deep technical PhDs like yourselves is that I get to have a little fun and check out where you work. But talking about LIDAR for a second, we believe that LIDAR will be everywhere. Right now, they're very huge devices. But uh, on the left, for example, they're big mechanical devices that are hard to scale. In the middle, you've got solid state, which there are dozens and dozens of solid state LIDAR companies, which is basically LIDAR enabling any computer to see in 3D. We invested in Voyant on the right, which is leveraging silicon photonics. And it's the size of your fingertip and the opportunities to leapfrog an industry. Many people say that's not possible. It's not physically possible. But what we love is finding PhDs that say, we've found the solution to evolve physics and silicon photonics to enable the world to see in 3D. Here's an example from Yo, uh, uh, as far as estimating the future of photonics. A lot of it is in, gonna be in data centers, but what excites me is the orange section as well, which is where applications of silicon photonics will exist. Here's one subject that's near and dear to Matthias and the group there and Synthesia. You know, synthetic data versus real data. So for those of you that are not sure the difference, you know, real data is captured in the real world by photos and video, but synthetic data is computer generated. There are companies out there generating their own models to help e-commerce. So kind of the David and Goliath, how can a small startup gather data? Well, done the right way, they can syn synthetically model data which this company, iFi, is doing for e-commerce and checkout solutions. They've actually fully modeled what it's like for hundreds of people to go into a gigantic, you know, for example, maybe a Walmart or a, a, a Best Buy or a big supermarket in order to synthetically model what it's going to be like to allow people to have checkout without humans. For example, these toothpaste are fake. They're not real images of toothpaste, but uh, this allows the training of synthetic models. Another example, this is out of the OpenAI group was several years ago, where uh, VR training uh, a robot to pick up blocks. And so historically this would be done uh, with real world, real world data, but now being done with synthetic. Or a picture of an avatar of myself modeled via synthesia. Another exciting sector is how synthetic data can help understand the use of pesticides and model out impact in society. And this is a great example, a reminder of, we don't like to just invest in technology for technology's sake. Uh, there's great opportunities for scientific research for technology's sake, but we get excited about how we can help and collaborate with technical people to find huge uh, solutions to world problems, and then hopefully make a lot of money while we sleep together. E-commerce, for example, photographing yourself and repositioning or superimposing different clothing just by using your smartphone. Another sector we analyzed last year, which is logistics and manufacturing, so factories. The movement of all factories historically are assembly lines and people on the assembly lines. Now the historic evolution from uh, uh, different industrial revolutions is that each time there's automation. Everywhere there's a human looking, eventually there'll be a computer looking and new jobs will be created for people um, at other aspects of the logistics and manufacturing line. This obviously is futuristic and like uh, when I started LDV Capital in 2012, everybody said focusing a venture fund on computer vision and visual tech is cute, niche, and science fiction. But 
today we all know, especially this audience, that it's really coming to a reality of the impact and value of computer vision on business and society. For example, there's two people here in a warehouse that's delivering e-commerce, but used to be hundreds of people. And the robots are moving all of those products around in a warehouse. Once again, different types of robots. And obviously, but just to reiterate, none of these robots could do their job without seeing with different sensors and different algorithms to make sure they deliver on time and most efficiently. Obviously autonomous vehicles. Now this is very futuristic and not sure when this is gonna be, but different steps, very small ones, like a, a camera in a car or in logistics, this drone could not get from point A to point B safely without computer vision. And once again, a robot with FedEx. Simple things that are obvious, but that you can see on top, there's a, 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 a LIDAR and a camera. And we're, who's gonna win, the LIDAR, the camera, the radar? We're not sure. And we defer to you to tell us from your expertise, who's gonna win. But why do we care? The majority of data that our brains process is visual, like we mentioned earlier. Visual data equals photos, videos, all visuals for human, humans to communicate. And as we reiterate, the majority of data that AI will have to analyze will be visual. More cameras is not the goal for me. The goal is better communicating and understanding our lives and our businesses. Here's a slide uh, that uh, I update each year, which says, okay, and I started uh, uh, as in the technology space. Before I was in, in building as an entrepreneur businesses, I was a professional photographer, a photo agent, and a photo buyer. And the ones in green are, are kind of uh, forecasts that I said, hey, the world's gonna go in this direction. And people thought I was crazy multiple times. The ones in green are the ones that have come true. I'm still waiting for that retina camera to happen so I could blink and take a picture of all you folks. Wearable cameras, satellite imaging, soon we'll have a satellite selfie. Uh, there's so many satellites in, in, in the sky and there's gonna be exponentially more at every angle. So I don't even have to carry my camera around. Hopefully eventually I'll be able to just receive images from security cameras in Times Square or from satellite images that sees that I'm doing something interesting. As Matthias mentioned earlier, I'll go for the next couple of slides and talk about commercializing research and commercializing uh, projects that you might all be working on. And we're looking to partner with people like you that solve these big problems and hopefully improve society. We're looking for that outlier. You know, what we do typically is invest in people that everybody else says is crazy, but we believe has future potential. And that is really exciting. Unfortunately, we meet uh, a thousand people a year, but only invest in three to five. I hate saying no all the time, but over time, the, the, the opportunity, unfortunately we hear no all the time. And there's a phrase that I always say is that no never means no, it means not now. How can you convince or inspire me to get from a no to a maybe to a yes? And that's not just me, it's everybody trying to get a co-founder to join you, trying to prove a research paper. Matthias and I talk about, okay, how do you get noticed, especially these days when you can't go to a conference? There are many opportunities to do that. We can talk about that during the Q&A. But let's talk about reality. I keep on talking about this and I, I would prefer doing rather than talking. Here are five examples of first time entrepreneurs that are PhDs or deep technical people who we've invested. So clarify, Matthew Zeeler, there was two people on his team. He was just working with Rob Fergus and Jan LeCun at uh, NYU. And he came up with uh, unique algorithms to automatically detect objects and emotions and images and video. Today, there's a lot more technologies out there that are doing that. But when we invested, it was, everybody kind of thought it was crazy and where, where's the value? Uh, wizard, uh, Tony in Copenhagen and his co-founders, uh, his research was how can we automate web app development and prototyping? And they basically created a, a vision brain that 
you could draw on a piece of paper or a whiteboard your prototype or the, 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 the wireframe for a prototype, take pictures of it. It automatically generates a working prototype and you can download the code. Um, once again, he had a, a, a research paper, he had an initial prototype, he got a bunch of press, and then we were excited to find him from our network. Synthesia, as Matthias mentioned earlier, he and Lourdes and uh, two co-founders um, and a great team in London are building a synthetic media platform. Voyant is another example, the LiDAR on a chip company I mentioned earlier. Chris and Steve are PhDs, uh, we're our PhDs, but we're working at the, the premier silicon photonics lab at Columbia with um, Mikhail Lipson, and they commercialized their research. And recently our venture partner, Peter Stern, joined them as uh, president. Ezra is another example. The co-founder is Diego Cantor out of Western University in Toronto, and they're building uh, the future of proactive cancer screening with MRI. Another bucket or example is serial entrepreneurs who we love to invest in as well, who have already sold companies and have been doing this for a while, which Mapillary, Dr. Jan Eric Solem, who uh, was one of the co-founders of Mapillary in Sweden, and uh, recently sold Mapillary to Facebook. Norbert is another one we haven't announced yet, but Dr. Alexander Winter is a serial entrepreneur in the computer vision space. And you'll hear more about that coming soon. So these are just a couple of data points. We're not gonna go into the details. We can talk in more as the Q and A session, but where do we find people and what, where are the kind of key drivers? And as I mentioned before, um, we don't invest in technology. We invest in people building technology because people hire people, people make revenue, people build teams. And that's at the stage of the earliest stage of investing. Uh, we invest in the pre-seed and seed, or even earlier, get to know students and professors maybe a year or two before they actually commercialize something. It's always better to learn earlier and get to know people over time because uh, um, we can collaborate and help them. We might not invest in every project, but we're, we want, as an entrepreneur for 18 years, I want everybody to succeed if I can help them. Number two is that deep domain expertise. So whether or not you have deep domain expertise in synthetic media or in healthcare, medical devices, or in agriculture, you really should try, I mean, everybody says they're looking for the next idea. The best place to look for your next idea is in your backyard, in your, what you know day in and day out. And hopefully you've been working on that for many years. Um, a unique solution to big business or societal problems. So this is one of the biggest challenges because um, there's lots of technology, as I mentioned earlier, that has value, scientific value and research value. And, and, and that's valuable. So you always have to think about whether or not you wanna commercialize or not. It's not about uh, the investor's reasoning, but I always say it's about the individual. What kind of business? What do you wanna do every day? Life is short. You gotta make sure you enjoy and make the most value of every single day you do something. And so if you have an unfair advantage, knowing that there's a big problem in society, meaning, or a business that you're, for example, the LIDAR chip. If you can make a LIDAR exponentially smaller and exponentially more affordable with similar or better resolution and, and visual data capturing, if you believe that the macro trend is that LIDAR will be everywhere, then that, those data points will highlight you know, probable opportunities. The challenge is saying, okay, we've got this great technology and ask people, would you buy this? And a lot of people will say yes. But then sometimes I was on a phone earlier today with entrepreneurs and, and, and basically get them to give you money. And that's hard. But get, you know, initial partners or pilots are excited to be in on the ground floor. And there's many ways to do that. So technical differentiation and defensibility. This is not just IPs, but you gotta have uh, an approach that others can't do easily. And to be able to say and have some modeling and, 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 and validations 
And one of the things with a lot of very deep technical uh, visionaries and experts, they want perfection. Okay, they don't want to come out until it's absolutely perfect. But you have to start building the relationships and, and finding co-founders and potential investors early on. And don't worry about sharing a little bit more than you might want to, because ideas are easy. Execution of building and solving problems and building commercial business is actually the hardest part. So the macro trend, as I mentioned earlier, let's talk about the LIDAR again. If you believe like I do, that every computer will see in 3D. Now the question is, okay, what are the opportunities to do that? You can't fit a huge LIDAR or a huge camera inside your phone. But if you believe all phones within five to 10 or 15 years, like I do, will have LIDAR chips in them, then that's a positive macro trend. In 2003, I wrote an article online when I had hair, you can go check it out, that, uh, camera phones would replace point and shoot cameras. Everybody thought I was crazy. I've gotten used to that. The challenge is not if they'll replace point and shoot cameras and if they'll replace DSLRs, they definitely will. The question is when and by who and whose unique technology will deliver the exponential value to society and a big business. Initial validations is the key last piece. There's a great, article online that says people invest in lines, not dots. And what we mean by a line on the chart is every time you meet somebody, it's a dot. And then all of a sudden you meet them again and you show improvement, it's another dot. But all of a sudden then you fail and it's a dot that goes down. But you succeed in, in, in fixing the pr problem and it goes up again. And think about yourself over a year, two years or five years on multiple interactions with people. So for example, probably Matthias would say the first time he met me, he's like, oh, that guy's interesting. I don't know about him. Uh, but over time, you keep meeting, you keep on seeing a history, whether or not that's with business, with co-founders, with researchers, with professors, in relationships. We all invest in trends uh, and we all commit time to trends. Commercializing, the four most important things, team, exponential, better solution. If your solution is one or two times better, that's positive, but likely it's not a leapfrogger. It's not really gonna convince somebody, oh my God, that's so much better than what I have now and I will pay you for it. So prototypes, multiple fast prototyping to prove it. Uh, it's kind of that scenario of, do you hear the tree fall in the forest? The answer to me is no. But if you start showing initial prototypes that are not perfect, that kind of validate initial steps towards your vision, that will help you say it's working, but it will also help others to understand more of your vision and your validations. And then again, as we talked about initial validations, it could be a research paper, it could be an article on the press, it could be an interview uh, um, on YouTube. Just keep on adding incremental steps and validations to sharing that you're on to the right track. Here's an example of one of my pictures. And to reiterate what I started in the beginning of this presentation, life is short. You gotta love the living of life. This photo was captured with a Nikon F and black and white film, which I used to process in the dark room myself. It's just the beginning. So I hope and look forward to meeting many of you and hoping that many of you succeed. And one of my mantras, I don't have it on today, but I've got an LDV Capital shirt that says Carpe Diem. Life is short, make the most of it. Thanks very much and happy to answer any questions that any of you have. Hey, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, are there any questions uh, from the audience? I mean, I can, I can try to summarize a few. I mean, I have, I have a very simple question to maybe start it off. Like, what do you think for a PhD student who just is graduating, what's the right approach? Like, who to reach out to? What's the right message? I mean, I understand you get some credibility with research papers, right? You're validating your own research. It's sometimes it's working in reality. Sometimes it needs a bit of more iterations. Um, but what do you think is the right approach for somebody who is, who is just, you know, just finishes a PhD, wants to start a business? What, what advice would you give them? I think the right, uh, the first steps are um, 
finding other people that believe in you, whether or not you're a professor and, and people close by. And, and, and more importantly, if your research is in, for example, uh, uh, synthetic media or uh, LIDAR, what's interesting is that you're probably working hopefully already with some smart people that have expertise in this space. If they, if you prove to them that you're doing something unique, they will introduce you to other people. And it's this one introduction to one, introduction to two, introduction to three. Um, and, and then I think the most important thing after that is, is publishing. And I don't need to say publishing a research paper, but publishing a blog post or even just short messages online and start to get a following of people that believe you are doing something extremely unique. And if they believe you are, and obviously that a lot of people want to skip from like day one to success, okay? But incremental meeting people and introducing to other people is, is the way it happens. And there's a couple of examples just to reiterate. Many people and entrepreneurs forget this. For example, Google, when Google started, you had, you had, you had two people, you know, two students at Stanford, they had a global vision of uh, you know, making the world searchable. Their first product was PageRank um, and it was one, one prototype that started gaining traction. They didn't have all of the features and all the products and all of the cloud computing and all of Gmail day one. For several years, they only had one uh, product. And I think people get ahead of themselves worrying about how they're gonna do everything. And the key is having a big vision, but starting small and building on it. And, and, and so I, that, that's the best way to do it in, in my mind. Cool. Um, any other questions? Not for me. I mean, there's a few questions on YouTube, but I want to give people on, on Zoom first an opportunity. And, and there's one of these things that I always say, if you know me, um, it's like that tree falling in the forest. You know, as Matthias just asked, how do you start? by meeting that one person. The best way to do it is ask the most brilliant question that all of us say, wow, that person's smart. I wanna to speak to that person. But if you don't ask a question, we don't know who you are and we have no understanding or interest to follow up with you because you don't exist. So start, I mean, you do exist, but I'm being very difficult and direct as a New Yorker. Ask the questions and there's no wrong question. Maybe I should open up Zoom, open up the live feed without the audience. Well, I can ask the on. questions. It's, it's okay. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether somebody on Zoom has a, has another question. Like students always are a bit shy at the beginning. Um, no, I can I can ask some other questions on YouTube. So um, there were actually several. So um, one of them is asking about hyperspectral imaging applications. Um, there's high cost, but you know how do you think the future of it? Yeah, hyperspectral is a very exciting sector that we're looking at a lot, and it, it's high cost today. But you know what you have to do when you're thinking about building a business or technology. Think about you know like Moore's law with chips. Will hyperspectral imaging and 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 the hardware and the vision stack of hyperspectral? Where do you think it's going to be in five years or ten years? Map it out in your own expertise. At what point will it get? devices get smaller and more accurate. And if you think it's in three or four or five years, think about the technology that you can help get that. And start it about three or four years, that business before it's a reality. Because the successful businesses that we invest in usually are building something today that will have value in the market in, in one, two, three or four years. And if you wait four years, then it's too late. The other competitors were already probably uh, 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 beat you in, in, in that approach. Um, another question is asking, what do you think about the future of the sports tech industry? Well, computer vision and sports, I mean, sports tech, uh, uh, obviously uh, the sports industry and people watching sports and being part of sports is a huge business. It's, it's a bit challenging right now during the pandemic, but there's a lot of examples. We've seen a lot of companies uh, trying to leverage computer vision to help uh, athletes train or to help actually, you know, almost the, the money ball of sports for virtual uh, betting. 
Um, I think those are interesting. There's a challenge of, there's a lot of commoditization quickly on the object recognition and tracking of those businesses. So the, the, the question is, how do you get to the next level uh, to, to create something different? The sports industry is also very challenging because there's a lot of rights to uh, the visual content for uh, sports players and leagues and TV, where you know the challenge, it's like the healthcare industry. The healthcare industry is a very bureaucratic uh, industry with a lot of FDA uh, and other governmental regulations. So you might be able to solve the technology problem, but think again to make sure you're solving a major need that will work uh, in, in the industry. Um, but I think there's definitely exciting opportunities in, in, in sports tech. Um, the next question is Hi, about... Ah, okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi, Evan. Um, I'm, I'm Pablo. Can I, I ask you? Nice to meet you. Thanks for the presentation. Really nice cool. Nice to meet you, um, Pablo. So I'm, I'm super interested in bringing computer vision to education, like to schools and kind of this AR for schools. Um, I always remember this Simpsons chapter where they kind of see a history class with uh, kind of uh, v VR. Uh, I don't know, I wanted to ask you, like, have you worked or do you have any kind of uh, projects where you have tackled this education uh, computer vision problem or bring in, yeah, <laughs> computer vision? Yeah, we have, that's a good question, Pablo. Um, we have not worked yet uh, in a VR or AR project business for the education space. Um, I think in AR and VR, there's lots of long-term opportunities. But we're, you know, unfortunately, that sector has gone through many cycles of up and down hype, and 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 kind of we're in the trough of disillusionment again. But I think the education uh, sector will benefit from VR. The just challenge is you got to think about when the mass adoption will happen. Uh, for several years, there's been many smaller projects that are that are being tested, but uh, it's still early as far as some of the tech. Uh, miniaturization and, and, and quality. And I think the big challenge there is, you know, thinking about the timing. Back to one of the slides I mentioned on the macro trend, when will the technology and the mass adoption exponentially grow? And it's great to build a project for some people in schools or education to learn, but, and that's great. You, you know, funding is just a means to an end. Not everybody has to build a business that raises venture capital. You could build a product that solves uh, problems in education and people are happy, uh, um, but you gotta, for mass adoption, I think it's gonna take several years um, for VR in education. Thanks a lot. Sure. Okay, we, have, we have more questions on YouTube. Um, one important question I think is, is very important. What about ethical issues like policing, hiring, stuff like that, you know, like how, how do you deal with this from a, from a VC standpoint? Yeah, I think, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, ethical questions are, are critical to everything in society. Um, and especially in new companies that might be trying to, to uh, disrupt businesses. And uh, the, we, we look at, uh, everybody has a different kind of filter of the types of people they want to invest in and the type of businesses they want to invest in. And uh, we believe that the most important thing, as I said earlier, is investing in the people that, are, that are, have the right ethical perspective. Um, whether or not it's creating synthetic media or whether or not it's security. Um, obviously, uh, privacy has changed drastically in the last uh, 10 years, if not 20 years. And it's going to change even more. Privacy as we know it has changed and is not the same and it will never be the same again. But maybe technologies will be able to you know, enable us to have more privacy um, and in, in different ways. And then in other ways have less privacy. But we don't you know, dictate ethics, but what we do is at least we have a choice. Every investor has a choice who they invest in. And finding the investor that is al aligned with your ethical uh, perspective or your bias uh, is is the most important thing. One of the things with people talk all this all the time, where uh, you know, investing or finding the right investor to collaborate with 
it's like a marriage, but you can't get a divorce, okay? And it's a marriage for at least 10 to 12 years. So think about really hard about, you know, who you might be collaborating with, that they see eye to eye with you on your ethical um, bias or needs. Um, and that's the way I kind of look at that. My experience from the ethical standpoint, once you, you lower your standards, it's very difficult to get back. So I would always start as strict as possible. Like once you lower it, it's, it's so difficult to get reputation back or so on, right? Like this is just I, so Yeah, ab ab absolutely agree. It takes a lifetime to build trust and a second to lose it. Yeah. I mean, this is, I think, specifically important in the startup scenes when you have so many players sometimes working on similar things. There's, it's, it's also enough to have like one player to kill a reputation for an entire area, which is really tricky sometimes, right? Especially in the VC space, right? You know, like there's competition across VCs, you have companies. And I think it's very, very important to have a high standard, especially when it comes to AI, how the press reports about it and so on. So I think these are, I think everybody here has a responsibility starting from VCs to academics, to founders and so on, right? I, th I think you're absolutely right. And another thing to add to that, which is very interesting and sometimes it's forgotten. Um, you know, what's interesting is that, uh, you, know, you know, as the question says, you know, computer vision seems to be fraught with ethical issues. What I'd like to, let's take a, let's go, go a, bit, a bit more macro. Humans are fraught with ethical issues. Before computer vision existed, there was issues of ethics amongst humans. And it still is, and that will never change. So for example, bias in computer vision and facial recognition. That's a very important subject. We need to decrease the bias and try to make it as unbiased as possible. But the problem is humans are biased. Every media publication is biased. Every tweet and every question is biased. And so that, that kind of comes back to, as, as Matthias said, it's all about the people. And obviously in the future, it's gonna be the people that are programming you know, AI. Um, and, and hopefully uh, we know uh, for good or for bad, or for bad, there will be good AI and bad AI. There's good humans and bad humans, but some of the bad humans think they're good humans. So there, there, there's a bit of a challenge here that we're trying to have, there's no holy grail that software will heal all of the uh, problems of society, but hopefully we can have more uh, positive, ethically appropriate impact. And once again, it's about what you build and who you work with. Um, and fortunately, there's going to be a lot of people that are counteracting the negatives in society with technology, but they're going to keep on battling those negative aspects of society. Um, yeah, I think the next question is also super interesting. Um, so Bala is asking, he's a master's student right now, do I need a PhD to pursue an idea? Okay, so this is, I mean, obviously, we, uh, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, this subject with this group, I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> but uh, my view is no. However, you back to my statements earlier, in order to have deep domain expertise and an unfair advantage and to study a market over time, a PhD is a great way to work with smart people to figure out how you can leapfrog what exists today. And so I think there's a fantastic value in getting PhDs because it's, you know, there is a, a period of time and value of deep diving into a subject and only focusing on that. And then over time, but that if you're in the right sector at the right time, you'll see where the industry is going and be able to apply your insights. But is it needed? No. Um, you know, the question is how do you get that unfair advantage um, and a deep scientific uh, uh, studying with brilliant professors like, uh, like uh, Matthias or Serge or Lourdes or Fefe or, or Jan LeCun or you know, whoever you're gonna work with, you wanna be able to find the value add so you can differentiate among everybody else. Maybe I can add one, one thing from my own experience. So I think it's not necessarily about the PhD, but I think once you have research papers, um, this gives you just so much credibility. It like shows you are the domain expert. If you have a bunch of CVPR, SIGGRAPH papers or whatever, right? It, it's just, people want to talk to you suddenly. The, the change is everything. Um, I don't think necessarily 
getting the PhD as a degree is, is the holy grail. I think it's rather about like, you know, what you said before is like building up your network, building up your reputation, making connections. And a PhD, I think is a great way to do that. But I think eventually it comes down to, from a research perspective, like, I mean, I guess, I guess LDV is also a bit special because the, the fund is very focused on computer vision, right? It's, it's very unique in a sense. So for us research, that's like the dream come true, right? We can, right. We can realize our research, but I think, in that space, you have to also prove you can play with the big boys, right? Like this is like, yeah. th th this is a thing that is that is very difficult, I think. Um, and I think as a master student, I think, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm reading it right now. It says, I'm just a master student. It's a wrong attitude. I think master student means you have all, everything ahead of you. You have all the opportunities still to go. I think I would see this as, a, as an opportunity. You can still decide what you're gonna do, how you're gonna make an impact and how you're making, you know, your dream come true in a sense. So. Um, I, I think this is a very, like, it has to be seen as a positive way. It's the beginning of a career. <laughs> it's not at the end yet. I agree. And I mean, we've invested in people that are master's students and never got their PhDs. Um, and so, but, but let me, you know, I agree with Matthias, what you're saying. Take it, a, there's another example. So obviously, if you're a master's student at a certain uh, lab or a PhD, and let's say you work with Matthias and, and you reach out and Matthias emails me, hey, we got this great student that I've known for years. It's all about the connections of people who we trust. So I trust Matthias. And if he says, you gotta talk to this student who's doing great things as a PhD or masters, uh, we will speak. Um, or if you're not getting a PhD or masters, but you've built up a network and you are the expert because you're posting blog posts or doing video edits or, or publishing your prototypes. And, and all of a sudden we're looking and everybody in our expert network says, Oh my God, look at Sally. Sally has been building, you know, these prototypes. She doesn't have a master's or a PhD, but what her output is, is better than anything I've seen from any PhDs. So it's not the title or the label. It's what you're showing the world and even just a segment of the world, just the people who care in that sector that you're focused in. And so the key is, you know, uh, you know, I used to joke about if you know, I might be the oldest one here in the group, but it was an old commercial shampoo commercial, which said, you know, and they told two friends and they told two friends and they told two friends and everybody started using the same shampoo. You, you start small uh, and, 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 and focused outreach will get you uh, uh, to success. And, and just a, a, another semantical thing, Bala, just a, when you to pursue the idea. Um, I like semantically to change that to say to, 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 to pursue the solution to a huge problem. And because ideas are easy, uh, execution is the hardest. Any other questions on Zoom? Does anybody have something? I have a short question. Great. Yeah, so I think uh, it is a very uh, risky job to, to do investment. So uh, you also mentioned briefly in your talk, how what is the criteria, how you pick up a company that you want to invest. So can you brief summary, what is the, you, you also said that you invest more in people than the idea or than the technology. So right. can, can you summar, sum, summarize what is the, the most important thing that you are looking for before you want to invest in the company? And how, uh, how can you make sure that your investment uh, will make the company also become successful? Okay, so you know, we, uh, we invest in people that have deep domain expertise, building a, a solution, a unique solution to a big problem, have an unfair technical differentiation that are at the right time in the positive macro trend and that can show us that they uh, are gonna deliver uh, and execute no matter what. And it's really about interacting with people. And uh, the way to kind of explain that is, uh, we like to invest in doers, not talkers. There's a lot of people that will talk and say they're gonna do something, but show us some initial validations and results. So those are the key kind of data points. And obviously they're not scientifically uh, measured so that you can actually say you got to the 100% on each one, but you got to show each and validate each one of those aspects. And then on the flip side, when you said, how do you make sure they're a success? 
uh, we can't, we don't run the companies. We can only, we, our goal is coaching and we get very involved uh, to the extent the entrepreneurs need and want. Frequently, after we invest, we have a call every two weeks, even with the serial entrepreneurs to talk about hiring and firing and product market fit and KPIs and, and timelines and goals. And then once they raise more money, then it goes from every two weeks to every three weeks to every four weeks. And, and our job as an investor is not to do, but it's to coach um, because you guys run the businesses. And that's a very challenging but important balance uh, when collaborating because we, we look at it as partners um, and we try to act as valuable partners. And you can talk to any one of the CEOs we've collaborated with um, uh, and I think they would validate that that's, that's how we act um, and, and that's what they want. And obviously you don't want to get in the way and you don't want to get too far in the weeds. So it's really about, uh, there's many things that entrepreneurs and people have to learn on their own. And we hopefully will help them avoid the train wrecks. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, you're welcome, Alan. Who else on the uh, Zoom chat? We got Felix, we've got Norman, who else? Manuel, you got a question? Hey, hey uh, nice talk, uh, Ivan. Uh, I have thank a follow-up question on Bala's question. So do I need to go to the Silicon Valley to start uh, my own business? Like. We actually had a previous, no. uh, we had a discussion uh, in the group like two days ago that it seems like all the big startups only rise from, um, yeah, the Silicon Valley and like Europe or Germany specifically is like far behind. Uh, is it like only that like the shiny and big startup stories are coming from the US or is it like more the market diversity in Europe, which makes it more difficult? Well, I think... Europe in the last 10 years have exponentially grown in numbers of valuable companies created. Um, and more and more companies are being created in areas that are not Silicon Valley. I mean, we're based in New York. We invest about 30% of our companies are in Europe. You know, Mapillary is in, was based in Sweden and sold to Facebook. Um, and, you know, there's many companies in Europe, TransferWise, uh, um, uh, Aiden uh, and a bunch of others successful businesses and I think over time there'll be many more businesses one of the things uh, the network effects of entrepreneurs successful entrepreneurs and teams will create new businesses and so you've heard of the PayPal mafia or the different groups of like you know successful people creates more successful opportunities and, and that is happening in Europe and a lot more things we love investing in Europe Uh, as long as the teams have global commercial opportunity. And so likely for all the companies we invest in Europe, they have a big uh, market opportunity in the United States. And there's a huge value in having deep technical teams in Europe. And maybe over time, the sales and business might be in the United States. But even UiPath, UiPath started you know, in, in Eastern Europe. And you know, now they're a US company, but they started there. Uh, you know, so you don't have to move to Silicon Valley to start a business. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. Cool, thanks. All right, um, who else? Norman, Shiva, who else? Felix, I see you guys, but I don't see you guys. Where are your questions? Yeah, hey, can you hear me? I can, Felix. Hi, um, nice to meet you. So I would like to to more or less ask a question that already someone mentioned on on youtube which would, which wasn't addressed yet, and i think it's very interesting okay um, which is how how as a like as a researcher i think you are we're somewhat biased to to have like a technology push in the way that like in research you it's very focused on the idea or the scientific value but not so much about maybe the the commercial value or the actual commercial problem for society or for big business that you're solving. Um, so what, what is your take on that? Do you have any tips for, uh, for um, how you can get the right measure there or how you can apply your, your scientific ideas better to the real market? Yeah, sure. I think that's a, that's a great question, Felix. And so I might've mentioned a little bit earlier, but uh, I think, you know, if you have a desire or at some point to commercialize something and you're working on a scientific, uh, you know, more scientific approach, 
the best thing to do, even though people don't like it, is is as Matthias mentioned, and I mentioned, I think earlier on a, in a different subject, talk to people in that space. You know, LinkedIn and other ways online. You know, everybody's published. You know where they work. And so, for example, if you are working in a in, in the next generation localized mapping platform, you know, all the people that are building mapping businesses out there would probably love to speak with you. And you can have informational discussions about what their biggest problems are. Obviously, the challenge is sometimes they might not share their real problems as a business, but starting to talk to more people and asking them about whether or not they have similar problems or how do they address solutions and, and just get to know people and so that you can have virtual drinks or virtual meals with those people. Smart people are always looking for other smart people to learn about the future from technical, uh, 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 technically savvy people. And so a systematic, so what's interesting is that PhDs and science uh, researchers are very systematic in their research, but they're not systematic in interacting with other people in their sector typically. And so if you use your same systematic approach on how you go about solving a problem, put, try to also do a mirror uh, process with finding the right people and, and, and asking them and getting, building up a relationship with them uh, on, on what problems they're seeing in a sector. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so you're specifically saying to get into more contact to people in the industries that actually might have the problems that you're working on? Yeah, and just ask them. And if they, you know, if, you know, the challenge here is that sometimes 50 of them will say, I have this problem, you know, and you can solve that and that's good, but make sure you think further out because they might have that problem today. But if somebody else solves it tomorrow, in two weeks, that problem is no longer a business. So the question is longer term, what are big problems? That's one way to do it. Additionally, the challenge is sometimes customers don't know they have a problem and don't know it can be solved, right? And so the, the kind of, for example, Airbnb, if you did a market analysis and you asked any, you know, every, the industry of whether or not people would let people you know, sleep at their apartments and their rooms and their, rent their spaces, they all would have said no. Um, but if you had an unfair, unique view on the way the future is gonna be, that's when you know, it gets very exciting to to build uh, uh, solutions. But right, the tricky question we, might be. Oh, sorry. I, I think we probably have to slowly summarize because uh, we don't want to go too much over time. Um, there's still a couple of questions on YouTube. Unfortunately, I don't think we can go over all of them right now. Um, I think at this point, I would really like to thank you, Evan, for being here. I think this is really great. Um, I, I hope also everybody else who is listening or will watch the videos on YouTube, um, I don't think, don't be shy, right? Reach out. Um, if, if you're interested in these kind of things, um, talk to us, talk to me. I can introduce you to Evan. I'm happy to forward the contact. Um, generally speaking, I would always say the, the university academic environment, this is really the key, I think, where we should, we should promote these kind of how to commercialize research much, much, much more. And I think it's, it's really fantastic that we have people like Evan who actually take the time they walk people through and it's not always about just asking, oh, I go to a VC, give me some money. It's about literally building these relationships over time, growing them and getting to know people. So I'm, so I'm really, really happy to have um, yeah, people like Evan around. I th think this is really fantastic and I, I can only encourage everybody, um, you know, go ahead and, and, and just do it, right? I mean, just go ahead and do it and, and, and then, then talk to us. I think that, that's really what we need to encourage a little bit more, especially here in Munich. I mean, I know we have a really vibrant startup scene, but I think it could be, it could still grow a lot more, I feel. Um, I, I, everything, I, I fully agree, Matthias, with, with your sentiment and what you're saying. And, and, and some, you know, as everybody knows, sometimes you don't get responses as somebody mentioned in, in the YouTube crowd, you know, I emailed somebody and they didn't respond. You know, that happens all the time. It happens to me, people don't respond to me as well. It's not just other people, but there's always a way to, you know, find more ways. I can't speak to absolutely everybody, but what I can do, and that's why we have these events um, where we try to gather people in together and educate. And I will respond to almost, you know, pretty much as, as many emails as I can. But what I also like to do is these events so that everybody also can meet other people. Um, and I just want to be transparent 
you know, because uh, we're all trying to do what we're trying to do and uh, um, helping each other, like we said before, is the best way to, to one plus one equals five. All right. So yeah, thanks a lot. Really great talk. Thanks a lot for the great discussion. I'm a bit sorry that we can't answer all of them. Um, Evan, just, just stick around. Um, we have a private Zoom chat for the follow-up. Um, yeah, I, I think there's like, a different link. Yeah. Um, and also thanks to everybody for, for asking questions. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Good luck.